Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Sunday. It's good to be together. It's good to be together to celebrate the anniversary of hope and center our attention around the event that changed our lives and billions of other lives across the planet and across history, the resurrection of Jesus. It's the resurrection of Jesus that convinced his followers that what he'd said about himself was all true, that all he spoke about was true. People may say that we believe in the resurrection of Jesus because it's written in the Bible, and that would be true. The thing is, though, we wouldn't have a Bible, at least there'd be no New Testament, if it weren't for the resurrection. The stories that Jesus told, the teachings he gave, the miracles he performed, the compassion that he showed, as amazing as all those things were, they likely would have all been lost to history the moment he died on a cross. For the disciples in that moment, as well as the Jewish religious leaders and the Roman authorities, Jesus' death crushed all hope of momentum in Jesus' story moving forward. As significant as we now know Jesus' death is, without a resurrection, the name of Jesus would have been lost amongst the thousands of others who died by crucifixion at the time of the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago. It's Jesus' resurrection that kept the story going. And Jesus charged his followers to spread the good news of all that he had done, taking on our sin on the cross and restoring our relationship with God the Father, who raised him from the dead, opening the way to everlasting life with him. Historians believe that the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, these accounts of Jesus' life on earth, were written around 30 to 40 years after the resurrection. So if they wanted to, the writers had plenty of time to embellish their story. But the way in which the Gospels are written shows that the writers kept things very very real. We need to remember that there were plenty of other witnesses of these same events, the resurrection of Jesus, who were still alive at this point. And they could have easily rejected any of the false accounts to the new believers. When it comes to the disciples and writing about the disciples, instead of being the heroes of the story, what we find is that the Gospels make all the disciples look terrible which is quite strange, especially when you consider they were wanting to get this movement, this Jesus movement happening. And Peter, of all the disciples, given his roller coaster ride of a relationship with Jesus, certainly could have smoothed out many of his interactions. What we read of the disciples, though, is that they were scared, that they were insecure and thought mostly only of themselves. They were terrified of what would happen to them now that Jesus had been executed. The movement that they were a part of ground to a halt as confusion, doubt, and panic reigned. There was no good news to share. They barely dared to speak as they were hidden away, locked away in a room in fear of their lives. The religious leaders were after them, and the Roman government made sure that anyone stepping sideways would be eliminated. Peter had been trying to explain that when he and John went to the tomb that morning, they found it empty, and he couldn't understand why. Just when Peter thinks Things couldn't get any worse. Now he has to deal with what's happened to Jesus' body. All hope was gone. But then what happened next changed everything. The world would never be the same again. In John chapter 20, verse 19, we read this. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews... Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
Now, peace is probably not the first thing you'd experience when you see someone you know was dead suddenly standing among you. But when you think about it, when you think about it, peace is the result of trust. When you trust someone, you feel at peace with them and what's going on. Essentially, what Jesus is saying here is that you can trust me. You can trust all that I've told you. You can trust all that I've done. Now, if someone says that they're going to die, and then three days later, I'll be alive, and that actually happens, then that's a pretty good reason that they can be trusted. Jesus' resurrection is the ultimate reason for our faith, our central reason to trust him. So with Jesus' resurrection as the foundation, I want to spend a bit of time this morning taking a look at how that event influenced his disciple, Peter. Not in the events that immediately followed, but further down the track. Let's first get a picture of Peter, perhaps one of the most well-known of Jesus' disciples. He's well-known because in all the accounts of Jesus' life on earth, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Peter is mentioned more often than any other person besides Jesus. Other than Jesus, no one speaks as often in the Gospels as Peter. Jesus spoke more often to Peter than any other individual. Jesus rebuked Peter more than any other disciple. Peter was the only disciple who dared to rebuke Jesus. Peter confessed Jesus more boldly and more accurately than any other disciple. And Peter also denied Jesus more publicly and forcibly than any other disciple. Jesus praised Peter more than any other disciple. And Jesus addressed Peter as Satan alone among the disciples. Talk about a roller coaster. Peter had first-hand experience with Jesus throughout his ministry. He had a front row seat to the powerful teaching. He saw the miracles. He saw the compassion for the poor and for the sick. But most importantly, Peter was an eyewitness to what we celebrate today, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, the event that launched Christianity, the central focus that kept the way moving forward. So we're going to pick up Peter's story about 30 years after this miraculous event as we read the opening remarks in the first of two letters that Peter wrote to the early believers. We need to consider the context around this first letter of Peter's. Peter wrote this letter around the year 64 AD. Around 30 years had passed since the resurrection of Jesus. We read further on in the letter that it was written from Babylon, which is believed to be a code name for Rome, a city steeped in immorality. Peter may have done that in order not to give away his location. It was a tough time for Christians, and that's an understatement. The, re the recipients of his letter were believers struggling in the midst of horrendous persecution. Nero You've probably heard of him. Nero was the Roman emperor around this time. And just prior to Peter writing this letter, Rome burned. And if you know your Roman history, you would have heard it said that Nero played his fiddle as he watched Rome burning. And he let it burn for six days. Many historians believe that it was Nero himself who had set the fire. Earlier in the year, the Roman Senate had denied Nero the funding to refurbish the city of Rome. So in order to get his way, Nero set Rome on fire. And to deflect attention away from himself, he blamed the Christians. The next three years became the bloodiest years in Christian martyrdom. Christians were hunted down, tortured and killed, accused of starting the fire in Rome. A Roman historian by the name of Tacitus wrote an account of what happened to the Christians following their arrest and imminent deaths. Here's how he described it. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with the skins of beasts, 
They were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt, to serve as nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Basically, they tied Christians to poles, painted them with tar, and then lit them up to light the streets or to light Nero's garden. And that's the background to Peter's letter. That what, that's what was going on at that time. Peter is very well aware of the suffering and the persecution. And Peter is writing to these struggling Christians, hiding or on the run, with an encouragement to stand firm in their faith. So we're just going to read the opening section of Peter's first letter. So here we go. First Peter, chapter 1. He introduces himself. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles, scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Peter writes to the Christians, God's elect, who have been scattered they were making their way through various regions around what we know today as Turkey. In the New King James Version, these early believers are described as pilgrims of the dispersion. Using the word pilgrim is a way of pointing to the fact that they were travelers looking for a better place. As Christians, we are passing through this world to a better place. So we're not to get too comfortable here. This is not our home. And Peter reinforces this notion that we don't belong here in the second chapter, referring to the recipients of his letters as foreigners or exiles. Or some versions say temporary residents. We're just passing through. Remember that central to Peter's faith was that he was an eyewitness to Jesus' resurrection. He wants to remind followers of Jesus, of what Jesus' resurrection means for them and why it also needs to remain central to their faith. Peter begins his encouragement with praise. Despite all that is going on for Christians at this time, he wants to realign the reader's focus from their current circumstances to the goodness of God. He goes on to write, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you. If we look back through history and if we look around the world today, we find one of the major markers of the human condition is despair. No doubt despair would have been fairly prominent with the early Christians. That feeling of, of walking through wet cement or miry clay. Life is hard and then you die. And then the next generation takes over. The cycle starts again. What's the point? Human existence appears as just an endless cycle of despair. King Solomon picked up on this point in the opening chapter of Ecclesiastes, where he wrote, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. Yet Peter reminds his readers, and that includes us, of God's great mercy. Life is merciless, but the cycle of despair was mercifully interrupted by the resurrection. Note that Peter describes God's mercy as great. If anyone, if anyone knew of God's mercy, it was Peter. Peter was the one who, at the most crucial time, denied Jesus three times. The guilt that he would have been feeling following that, that denial would have been immense. And thoughts of, if only I'd stuck up for him, if only I'd gone into fight, if only I had not denied him, if only. After the resurrection, when Jesus was walking along the beach, Peter recognized Jesus 
from the boat that he was fishing in. He threw off his robes and jumped into the water over to shore. In the conversation that followed, Jesus asked Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? Three opportunities for Peter to affirm his love for Jesus. See, Jesus demonstrated great mercy and invited Peter to follow him once again. In his mercy, we have been given the gift of the resurrection to interrupt the cycle of despair because death has now been defeated. Because of Jesus' resurrection, we also have resurrection into an eternal life with him. Peter writes that God has given us new birth. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. I like how the message paraphrases this, these couple of verses. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future starts now. If there was no resurrection, there would be no possibility of eternal life. A death without a resurrection, no eternal life. Jesus would not be able to give eternal life if he didn't have eternal life. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 19, because I live, you also will live. The resurrection not only demonstrated God's mercy, it demonstrated his gift of life. Now, the word life in the New Testament is the English translation of one of three Greek words. The first Greek word, often translated as life, is the word bios. Bios. Bios refers to the physical body. It's where we get our word biology from, the study of life. It's external life, the life that we observe around us. When Jesus said on the Sermon Um, on the mount. Don't worry about your life. That's the word bios there. Don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. Jesus was saying, don't worry about the externals. Interestingly, this is what we spend most of our time worrying about. Now, the second Greek word for life, translated into the English word life, is the word suke. The English word Psychology comes from this Greek word, suke. This is your inward life, your your thought processes. And it's used in Matthew uh, 16, 25, when Jesus says, "For for whoever wants to save his life shall lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Suke refers to the psychological life of the human soul. That is the mind and the emotion and our will. The third Greek word that's translated into as life is the word zoe. Zoe refers to the uncreated eternal life of God, the divine life uniquely possessed by God. This is the typical term for everlasting life, spiritual life. It not only refers to the quantity of life, in that life goes on and on and on forever, but also the quality of life. It's the quality of life that begins with the new birth that Peter speaks of. It's this spiritual life, this zoe that John refers to when Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Now, this concept is vastly different from thinking that Jesus came so that we could have a better or improved human life. Jesus came so that we could have him the divine life. By our physical birth, we possess only the physical life, the bios, and the inner life of the soul, the suke. When we talk about being born again, this refers to the eternal life, zoe, which we receive when a person believes that Jesus is Savior and Lord. What Jesus wants is for us to enjoy his life, Live by his life and let that life grow in us. 
then the riches of his divine eternal life will be expressed through us and on display for the people around us. Our hope in him will be evident because our hope is a living hope. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians reminded them of their life before their new spiritual birth. He writes this, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. At Easter, we celebrate the anniversary of hope. Hope is the one thing that this world longs for. We spoke earlier of despair. Well, hope is the answer. Peter writes that the resurrection gives us a living hope. Peter put his hope in Jesus, believed Jesus was the Son of God, saw the miracles, heard the teaching, but then the day that Jesus was crucified, all hope was shattered. He wasn't expecting that. When Jesus died, all of Peter's hopes died. And Luke records what the disciples were all thinking at that time. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. You notice that it's past tense. We had hoped. Hope died when Jesus died. But when the resurrection happened, Peter went from hopeless living to living hope. His hope came alive, never to be quenched or killed again. The resurrection demonstrated that every promise Jesus made was true. If he can rise from the dead like he promised, then every other promise can be believed, including what Jesus said about heaven. We have an assurance of heaven. The resurrection assured heaven to the readers of Peter's letter. In 1 Peter 1, verse 3 and 4, we read, In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Jesus spoke a lot about heaven. The kingdom of heaven, rewards in heaven, our Father in heaven. Peter and the other disciples all heard Jesus' teaching of heaven. And when Jesus rose from the dead, it convinced the disciples that all Jesus had said about heaven was real. Unfortunately, we don't tend to talk a lot about heaven. The early church talked about heaven all the time. Um, on Friday, I did a, a, a gospel concert with my brothers uh, up in Nambour, and we sang a whole bunch of gospel songs, and it, it kind of occurred to me that there are a lot of, of the old country gospel songs um, about heaven. Songs like, um, I'll Fly Away, or When We All Get to Heaven, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder, In the Sweet By and By, What a Day That Will Be. I'm kind of thinking we should maybe sing more of them. What do you reckon, Evie? <laughs> Leave it with me. I'll have a chat with the worship pastor. <laughs> now, Solomon, King Solomon, made it very clear that God has set eternity in the human heart. There's that sense inside us that there is more to life than just this life. There's more than just the bios life. There's a longing for the Zoe life, which was made possible by Jesus' resurrection. Our living hope becomes a lasting hope. If you're a follower of Jesus, his resurrection guarantees your resurrection. If If the resurrection has interrupted the cycle of death, We have nothing to fear. If the resurrection gives us hope, 
we should have nothing to regret. If the resurrection assures us of heaven, we should have nothing on earth to hold on to. This is what Easter should be about. It's not just an event. It's not just a long weekend. The resurrection of Jesus should be at the center of the way we live our lives every day. Can I invite you to pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the resurrection of Jesus that we celebrate here today. May our lives be lived with the new life that you have given us. May all we do and say reflect your life alive in us. We thank you for the good news story of salvation that we're reminded of at Easter and the hope that brings. We thank you for the living hope we have that points us towards eternity with you. May we continue to encourage one another of the hope and the life that we have in you. We ask this in the name of Jesus, the name above every other name. Amen.